Good morning, everyone. Today's presentation is going to be on pre-diabetes and diabetes through health equity lens, understanding your risk and importance of lifestyle. Today's uh, speaker is with Dr. Gwendolyn Jack and Jenny De Jesus. So I want to pass the floor to you guys. Whenever you're ready, ready, please. <laughs> Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here and thank you for inviting us for this a very important uh, discussion on pre-diabetes and diabetes, especially for National Diabetes Awareness Month, um, November. So I'll start off first uh, by just um, indicating that I'm an endocrinologist over at Will Cornell Medicine with a specific focus on pre-diabetes and diabetes. Next slide. So just a rough outline of the presentation. So first, uh, we will define prediabetes and diabetes, uh, discuss how do we diagnose diabetes, what are some of the symptoms of diabetes, um, a brief overview of the treatment for diabetes, and the important role of lifestyle management. So, so what is diabetes? So I always like to start off with a few key terms. One that you might hear of is glucose. So glucose is a type of sugar and all of our cells use it as an energy source. We get our glucose from the foods that we eat, especially carbohydrates. But the liver, the liver, which is an organ in our body, which you can see in the diagram there, it makes glucose when we are fasting or not eating. Insulin, insulin is a hormone that is made by the cells in the pancreas. And the pancreas is that tan colored organ that you can see on the picture there. And insulin allows our cells to take up glucose from our blood and use it as an energy source. Insulin also helps us stop the liver from making glucose when we are eating. And then insulin resistance. So insulin resistance refers to when the tissues in our body are less sensitive to the effects of insulin. And as a result of that, the sugar is not taken up from our blood very well, and therefore it remains in our blood. And we call that hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. So what is diabetes? So specifically diabetes mellitus. So there are different forms of diabetes mellitus. The two main forms are type one diabetes and type two diabetes. So type one diabetes refers to a condition where our body attacks our own cells in the pancreas that make insulin. And as a result of that, the pancreas is not able to make any insulin. So people who have type one diabetes require insulin at all times. Of course, they also benefit from changing their lifestyle in terms of um, healthy eating planning and also physical activity. But by and large, people who have type one diabetes require insulin because the pancreas is not able to make insulin at all. And this is different from type two diabetes. So type two diabetes is when the body is able to make insulin. However, the body does not process it or use it very well. So this relates back to that term of insulin resistance that I mentioned a little while ago. When people who have type two diabetes, there are different treatment options that we have available. And so that includes dietary changes, um, so healthy meal planning and increasing physical activity. Some people need medications, medications in the form of pills. Um, other people might also benefit from having injections called GLP-1 injections, which you'll learn about um, next week. And these are non-insulin injections. And then other people might benefit from insulin. And this is because over time, even though initially the pancreas is able to make insulin, because the pancreas has to put out so much insulin to combat the high blood sugar, over time of having high blood sugars, the pancreas can become what we call burnt out or exhausted. And in that case, it might reduce the amount of insulin that it's able to make. Next slide. So what is prediabetes? So prediabetes refers to when the blood sugar level is higher than normal, but not yet high enough to be considered type two diabetes. So think of it as it precedes the development of type two diabetes if it's left untreated. 
So how do we diagnose prediabetes and diabetes? So there are three, four main ways that we diagnose prediabetes and diabetes. So first is a blood test called hemoglobin A1C test. And this is a blood test that you get done at the lab or in the doctor's office. And a normal A1C is less than 5.7%. An A1C of 5.7 to 6.4% would be considered prediabetes. And an A1C of 6.5% or above would be considered in the diabetes range. Another task can, um, that can be done is a fasting blood sugar test. So this is when you go to the doctor's office or the lab and they draw your blood. And a fasting test means no food or drink except for water for at least 10 hours. So normally the fasting blood sugar should be less than 100. A fasting blood sugar level of 100 to 125 would be considered in the pre-diabetes range. And a fasting blood sugar level of 126 or above would be considered in the diabetes range. And then there's a third test called an oral glucose tolerance test. So in this test, again, this is a blood test. We ask the person to come in fasting. We check a blood sugar two hours after we give them a sugary drink because we want to see how their body is responding to that high sugar load. So normal response would be a blood sugar less than 140 after the two hours. A level 140 to 199 would be considered in the pre-diabetes range and a level of 200 or above would be considered the diabetes range. So those are the three main ways. However, there's a fourth way. So if someone presents with classic symptoms of diabetes, which I'll go over in a few slides, and their random blood sugar is 200 or above, we would consider that in the diabetes range. But then we would confirm it with one of the other blood tests, such as the A1C test. Next slide. And this is important because what we can see based on the data is that 37.3 million adults have diabetes, type 2 diabetes to be more specific. So that's one in every 10 people with diabetes. And one in five people are not aware that they have diabetes. Right. And diabetes can be very costly to the economy in general. So $327 billion is lost um, on diabetes uh, care. And then regarding prediabetes, 96 million adults are diagnosed with prediabetes. That's more than one in three adults have prediabetes. And more than eight out of 10 adults who have prediabetes are not aware that they have prediabetes. So 80% of adults who have prediabetes are not aware that they have prediabetes. Next slide. And then when they looked deeper into the data, they saw that there were differences of the rates of diabetes based on race and ethnicity. So by and large, 14.5% of the people who are diagnosed with diabetes were American Indian or Alaskan natives, 12.1% were non-Hispanic Blacks, another approximate 12% were Hispanics, and then 9.5% were um, Asian American and 7.4% were non-Hispanic whites. And then if they broke down even more among Hispanic adults, we found the majority were Mexican American or Puerto Rican. Next slide. So related to that, I think it's important to also highlight some terms that you might hear about or read about. So when we talk about health disparities, such as the one that we just saw, disparity in the rates of diabetes. So this is referring to a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantages. When you hear about health inequity, so these are unfair differences in the health status or in the distribution of health resources between different population groups. And these typically arise in the social conditions in which people are born, grown, live, work, and age. And we call those conditions social determinants of health. 
So more specifically, again, this is conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And these are shaped by how money, power, and resources are distributed at a global level, at a national level, and also at our local levels as well. Next slide. And this is again related to different factors. So there are five domains that they were able to identify. So one is education access and quality. So having access to quality education early on and throughout, and then also having health literacy or literacy in general. A second domain was, was health care and quality. So this includes having adequate health insurance, having access to culturally appropriate health care, having access to quality health care. Another domain was neighborhood and built environment. So this includes having affordable quality housing, having access to affordable and quality transportation, having access to parks, having walkable neighborhoods, right? So having access to sidewalks, um, having access to healthy food options, a fourth domain was social and community context. So this includes having community engagement or social cohesion, um, recognizing whether or not there is more stress in some communities as opposed to others. Also recognizing the differences in the exposure of, to violence and trauma. So that when we're telling patients um, or people to walk in their neighborhoods, but if they don't feel safe, then that's something that needs to be addressed. And then lastly, economic stability. So this in, includes occupation or employment, um, income, expenses, and debt. So all of these factors play a role in um, how we manage diabetes and how we're able to identify people who are at higher risk for developing diabetes, but also higher risk for developing complications due to barriers in uh, these five domains. Next slide. And this brings us to a very important distinction. So what is the difference between equality versus equity? So we can see in this diagram on top, equality, everyone is given the same exact tool, or in this case, a bicycle. However, everyone is not starting out the same way. So even if everyone re receives the same treatment, it would only work if everyone starts off in the same place. So this really highlights the point that not one size does not fit all. When we look at the bottom diagram, we see an illustration of equity, where everyone receives a report, the support that they actually need. Okay, so everyone should have access to the same opportunities. So we can't really reach equality if equity is not addressed. So when we think about diabetes and prediabetes, it's really important that we think about it and look at it through the health equity lens. Look at it as it pertains to diagnosis, as it pertains to complications, and then also the treatment plan. And I always emphasize that knowledge is power. There, I identified that there are barriers in place and there needs to be uh, different levels of institutions that really addresses those barriers. So, but what are the things that we can do and one of those things that we can do is really highlighted today, which is increasing awareness and identifying the risk. Next slide. So one of the tools that we highlight is a pre-diabetes risk test. This is a test that we will send a link for um, through the American Diabetes Association and the CDC. Um, so it is a test that you can use to assess whether or not you or a family member or loved one is at risk for prediabetes. So it asks a series of different questions. It asks how old you are, uh, whether or not you are a man or a woman. Um, if you are a woman, whether you've ever been diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And gestational diabetes is diabetes that is diagnosed when uh, someone is pregnant. Um, it also asks about whether or not you have a family history of diabetes. So a family history includes mother, father, or sibling with diabetes. It also asks, have you ever been diagnosed with high blood pressure or hypertension? Um, are you physically active? And what is your weight category? And if you score five or higher, 
it is really important to have a discussion with your medical team to get tested for prediabetes or diabetes. So the earlier the testing is done, the earlier intervention can occur. Next slide. And this is important because without intervention, about 15 to 30% of people with prediabetes will progress to developing type 2 diabetes within five years. Now, of course, this also is influenced by where that individual is on the prediabetes spectrum. So for example, someone with an A1C of 5.8% would have a different risk than someone with an A1C of 6.5%, which is already sort of bordering, bordering into the diabetes range. Next slide. So what are symptoms of prediabetes? The answer is none. So again, that highlights the importance of having regular medical care to make sure that you're being tested for prediabetes or diabetes. Okay. And now what are some symptoms of having uncontrolled diabetes? So some people might notice frequent urination, sudden unintentional weight loss, meaning there's been no changes in terms of meal planning or physical activity level, and they're just losing weight. Some people may notice that wounds are not healing as well as they should. They might also notice that they're feeling hungry all the time. Some people might notice sexual dysfunction. Some people might notice blurry vision. Some women might report that they're having more frequent vaginal infections, whether it's yeast infections or urinary tract infections because bacteria feed on the blood sugar. Some people might notice numbness or tingling in their hands or their feet, and this is because diabetes affects the nerves throughout the body, especially the hands and the feet. And then again, some people might notice that they're feeling thirsty all the time. So if you have one of those symptoms, or if you know someone who has multiple of those symptoms, really encourage them to get tested for diabetes. Again, the sooner the diagnosis, the earlier the intervention, and the reduced risk for complications developing. Next slide. So I talked about the A1C being a blood test that is often used for diagnosis. It's also a test that we use for monitoring. But we want to sort of see how that correlates with a blood sugar. So an A1C of 6.5% again was needed for diagnosis, and that corresponds to an average blood sugar of 140. An A1C of 7% corresponds to an average blood sugar of 154. And we'll talk about in a little bit that the target um, A1C for most people after they've been diagnosed with diabetes is having an A1C of less than 7%. Next slide. However, the A1C should not be the only measure. It's important, but it's really important to also get the context behind it. So I'm going to present three different examples of three people who all have the same A1C of 7%. Again, that's corresponding to an average blood sugar of 154. So we can see in the first example, based on the blood sugar data that the person is having, you know, checking their blood sugar on a regular basis, that 58% of the time, the blood sugar reading is above 180, meaning that they're having high blood sugar more than half of the time. 24% of the time, the blood sugar readings are less than 70 meaning they're having low blood sugar episodes or hypoglycemia 24% of the time. And hypoglycemia can be very dangerous. And 18% of the time, the blood sugar is within that gold green range of 70 to 180. Now we can look at example two. So in example two, a little bit better. So 63% of the time, the blood sugar is within that target green range of 70 to 180. So we're seeing that this person is still having high blood sugars. 29% of the time, the blood sugar is above 180. And they're also having low blood sugars. So 8% of the time, they're having hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, meaning the blood sugar is less than 70. And then we can see an example three. In example three, 100% of the time, 
the blood sugar is within the target range of 70 to 180. And so this is what we want to see. Next slide. And so I talked about glucose measuring. So there are different ways that someone can measure their blood sugar on a regular basis. So one includes a glucose meter, which is a device. Uh, the person will prick their finger, get a droplet of blood, and then insert that with a test strip, and there will be a blood sugar reading. Okay. And this is different from a continuous glucose monitor. So a continuous glucose monitor, you might see commercials for one of them is placed on the upper arm. Another um, a different type of continuous glucose monitor is placed on the abdomen. And these continuous glucose monitors check the blood sugar throughout the day. Okay. They just recognize that they're checking the blood sugar at different uh, points. So the glucose meter is checking the blood sugar that's in that capillary blood vessel in that red blood vessel there, or as a continuous glucose monitor is checking the bl blood sugar from the interstitial fluid. So that's the fluid in between the cells. So we usually recommend that people who have blood sugar less than 70 or above 200 confirm it with a finger stick. So what are the goals? The goal A1C, like I mentioned before, is having an A1C of less than 7%. Now, again, this might vary based on the person. Uh, so for example, for older individuals, individuals over the age of 70, we might not have the A1C be so strict because we want to reduce the risk of people having hypoglycemia. Whereas in a woman who is pregnant, we might want the A1C to be stricter. So an A1C goal of six to 6.5%. But by and large, for the majority of the population, the A1C goal is having an A1C less than 7%. And then as it pertains to the blood sugar throughout the day, before the meals, especially fasting, the blood sugar should be anywhere between 80 to 130. And then after meals, so typically one to two hours after the start of the meal, the blood sugar target is typically 80 to 180. Next slide. So how do we manage type two diabetes or prevent um, the development or reduce the risk of development of type two diabetes? So really the foundation is lifestyle changes. So that includes healthy meal planning and physical activity, which Jenny de Jesus will go into more detail. Um, and then also medication. So next week you will learn from Jane Seeley about the different medications that are used for managing type two diabetes. But I really want to highlight that it involves a team-based approach. So part of the reason why I'm presenting, Jenny de Jesus is presenting, she's a nurse practitioner, uh, we see patients together. Um, next week, you will hear from Rachel Stahl, who is a diabetes educator, and then also from Jane Seavey, who is a diabetes nurse practitioner. So this really emphasizes that it really requires a team. Okay. And also what you will learn is that we have different guidelines. So we adapt and tailor our approach to the person in front of us. Okay, so not one size fits all approach, but more of a tailored approach. And so I'm gonna pass it along to Jenny De Jesus, who will highlight in greater detail the importance of lifestyle changes. Hello everyone. Thank you, Jack, Dr. Jack. Um, so now that we have a good understanding of what diabetes is and some of the things that we monitor when we have diabetes and, and our risk um, and how to assess our risk for developing um, type 2 diabetes. We're going to go on to talk about and focus on lifestyle, which, um, as Dr. Jack mentioned, is super important for prevention of diabetes and management of diabetes once we've had a diagnosis. We're going to examine first um, this very important question and very um, common question that we get, can type two diabetes be prevented? The answer is yes. Um, and we know this because there was a very large study of over 3000 participants where uh, this question was evaluated. So there were three groups that were examined in order to answer this question. The first group received very intensive lifestyle intervention. Um, and um, support um, in order to achieve these um, 
these changes. The second group received education, but not as intensive and also received the medication called metformin. And then the lastly, the, the last group received the same intervention as far as education as uh, the group with uh, in the middle with the medication called metformin, but without the, the medication. So those three groups were evaluated um, and the results showed that there was a 58% reduction in the first group that received lifestyle intervention uh, without any medication. So this gives us um, the answer, um, which is yes, diabetes, type two diabetes can be prevented through very um, through intensive lifestyle intervention, which is very empowering. So how can we prevent type two diabetes? And when we're talking about prevent diabetes prevention, um, we're specifically talking about prevention of type two diabetes, um, not type one diabetes, as Dr. Jack mentioned the differences. Uh, we're talking about prevention of type two diabetes. So um, in a nutshell, this is how, these are the things that we're going to discuss, okay? So um, the way we are going to work towards prevention of type two diabetes and also management of type two diabetes um, would be through uh, physical activity. Um, and we're going to discuss a little bit more about this, but the general recommendation is that we get at least 150 minutes uh, a week of physical activity. Second, um, following a, a healthy meeting, eating plan or, or, or pattern can also help us prevent type two diabetes. And through those two um, interventions, achieving some weight loss. Um, and the weight loss that um, has been shown to be uh, beneficial for the reduction of the risk of developing type two diabetes is anywhere from uh, a weight loss of five to 7% if we are overweight or obese. So what that translates to is if I were to weigh 225 pounds, that means I would need to lose anywhere from 11 to 15 pounds which is five to 7% of the weight in order to receive the benefits of reducing my risk of developing type two diabetes. And sometimes, um, you know, we may think that I have to lose 40 pounds, 50 pounds, and that sounds like a very big uh, amount of weight, which it is to lose. Um, and it can kind of put us back a little bit because it, it's, it's challenging. Uh, but maybe thinking in smaller chunks can help us stay motivated and, um, and help us achieve our goal of reducing our risk. So it only takes 5 to 7% weight loss when we're overweight or obese to reduce our risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Now we're going to focus on a little bit more on um, that recommendation of physical activity. So as I said before, um, the 150 minutes a week is a recommendation for um, aerobic activities. So aerobic activities, anything that gets our heart rate going faster, and that can be a variety of things. It can be dancing. It can be, um, for example, like any type of aerobic uh, activities, for example, like Zumba. I can be playing a volleyball or I can be swimming, uh, bike riding. It can be walking and jogging. Uh, even gardening, which can be very fun, um, is um, considered moderate physical activity. Anything that gets our heart rate um, going, is, it falls into that category. And um, as we see, we can break it up throughout the week. It doesn't mean that I um, have to go to the gym for two hours a day. Um, 150 minutes a week spread out through the week uh, helps us achieve that goal. And then the second guideline is some, uh, including some muscle strengthening activities. So those, th these things can be, for example, like using our body, like we're using yoga um, to um, help us um, strengthen, our, strength our, strengthen our bones and, and, our, and our muscles, and also some weight training, which doesn't mean that we have to go out and lift very heavy weights, but even five, 10 pounds or whatever we can do. Um, can be very helpful. And we want to make sure that we're doing this at a pace that goes with what we've been doing in the past, rather than study, starting something very sudden, of course. And these things are, are very important for the reduction of our risk of developing type two diabetes, but so is flexibility and balance training that can be very helpful, especially as we age um, to decrease our risk of falls. 
These are some of the benefits of physical activity in addition to helping us uh, reduce our risk of developing type 2 diabetes and managing diabetes as well. Um, as we know, it can help us lower our glucose. It can help uh, reduce our, our cardiovascular risk or strengthens our heart um, and also helps us with that weight loss that we were discussing. Um, it's, it's going to be partnered with our next topic, which will be healthy eating, uh, but it can help us achieve that weight loss. Um, it increases our strength, our ease of movement, um, and our ability to live independently, which is very important. It may also um, improve our quality of life, reduces stress, increases energy, helps us feel better and sleep better. So exercise, as we see, has a lot of uh, benefits um, to our health. So here are some tips for um, increasing physical activity and getting moving and doing it in a safe manner. First of all, we wanna make sure that we start slow and we check in with our healthcare provider before we're starting any type of new exercise routine, especially if we have um, um, certain limitations um, and or conditions, okay? We want to make sure we make it fun. We're including our family, our friends, if, if our neighbors, if, if that's possible. Um, to keep us motivated and we can work together to, to achieve our, our, our goals, right? Um, when we have diabetes, it's very important that we are taking very, very good care of our feet. So if we're starting any type of physical activity, we want to make sure that we're wearing appropriate um, shoes and, and socks to uh, protect our feet. And we want to make sure that we're taking a look at our feet and examining our feet for any open sores or blisters that um, would need attention. Of course, we want to make sure that we are well hydrated before we exercise, during our exercise and after. Um, if we have diabetes, it's important that we're cautious um, and, and bring uh, our supplies that we would need in case we would have a low blood glucose during the time that we're exercising. For example, having our glucose meter and having something to treat um, the low sugar if it were to occur, for example, like hard candy or a little box of juice, okay? Something that we can easily carry in our backpack or, or our purse. Nowadays, keeping track of our steps can be a very easy way of um, assessing how much uh, we're doing and then kind of increasing it from there. There are several apps that we can use to um, track our daily steps. Um, so that's a very helpful way of recognizing how much we're doing and, um, and adjusting from there. And most importantly, setting realistic goals. If I've been inactive for a long time, I, you know, it's probably not um, realistic to say, I'm gonna go to the gym for two hours a day. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're doing it in a safe way and setting realistic goals that can help us stay motivated and stay on, plan, on our plan. Now we're going to move on to um, nutrition which is also a very important um, aspect of diabetes prevention and um, diabetes management. So four key principles that we're going to discuss are uh, my plate for balanced eating. Uh, second one would be uh, for us to learn how to be smart about choosing our carbohydrates. Third, limiting added sugars. And fourth, understanding a food label, which is super important. Um, in order for us to be able to make um, these healthy choices. This is my plate planner, um, and it's a very easy cheat sheet that we can use to monitor our portions and balance our meals. As we see here, um, this is a nine inch plate. Um, half of the plate is filled with non-starchy veggies that are not gonna have a big effect on the glucose, and it also doesn't have a lot of calories. So these include, uh, for example, here, broccoli, lettuce, cucumbers, tomatoes, but it could be um, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, um, cabbage, um, you name it, right? Eggplant, all of these things are, are very low carbohydrate and also don't have a lot of calories. Um, in addition to that, they have a lot of fiber, which will help us feel full so that we're not hungry when we're trying to adjust um, our portions. Then um, a quarter of the plate here you see is, for this example, is chicken. So a quarter of a plate is our protein. Um, so it could be chicken, um, turkey, um, 
basically all of the proteins that we love to have, we can, even red meats, um, with some caution, depending on other um, health conditions that we may have. But in reality, for diabetes, we can consume most things is just um, consuming it in moderation and make sure that we're balancing our meals. Then the uh, other fourth of the plate, quarter of the plate would be of our starch. So this example is rice and beans, but it can be um, pasta or potato, um, or rice, right? Um, any other type of uh, mix of rice. Um, so these things um, have the biggest effect on the glucose. And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, choosing uh, the uh, healthier um, carbohydrates to help us keep the glucose steady. Um, and also help us with weight. So the plate planner or uh, my plate planner is in kind of a nice visual for us to learn in which portions and, and balance ideally um, would, would be more beneficial for, for diabetes and diabetes prevention and management. Now we're going to move on to choosing those healthy carbohydrates, right? So um, their carbohydrates are what's going to have the biggest effect on the glucose because when we process them, they convert into sugar um, in our body naturally. So some of healthy carbohydrates, as we saw, um, I mentioned that the non-starchy veggies are not going to have a big effect on the glucose. They do have some carbohydrate, but very little. Um, some other um, starchy vegetables, for example, like potato, corn, or squash, they do have more carbohydrate than the non-starchy ones. Um, but as I said before, we can have them. It's just really about the portion of um, the, the portion that we actually put on our plate that's the most important. Then we have our whole grains, for example, like brown rice, or quinoa, whole, whole wheat pasta, whole grain pasta, whole wheat breads and cereals um, that can um, also have more fiber that can help us um, also with staying full, like I mentioned before. And then we have our, our legumes, like our beans, our peas, and our lentils that are also carbohydrate and will have an effect on the glucose, um, but they are also high in fiber and have protein. So they're not gonna have as big an effect on the glucose as the next group of carbohydrates that we're going to talk about. Then we have milk and yogurt and uh, fruits which are also carbohydrates, but um, we can definitely include them in the foods that we have and, and in our meal plan. Um, now, the second group are less healthy choices. For example, all the refined uh, grains like our white rice, our pasta, our bagels, muffins. And the, reasons, the reason why these are less healthy is because um, they're more processed, um, they have less fiber, and um, because of this, they're going to have an, um, um, a higher, the glucose is going to go up higher and quicker in comparison to um, the first group that we discussed. So it's going to raise our glucose um, higher and quicker than, than the first group. Um, flavored milk and yogurt, of course, um, will have a nice effect on the glucose as well and are considered less healthy choices for carbohydrates. Uh, dried fruit and, and um, um, sorry, my doggy wants attention. Um, dried fruit or uh, fruit, um, fruit that's in canned um, or, or, or juice or syrup also are gonna have a bigger effect on the glucose. And things like ice cream, um, candy, chocolate, snacks, such as uh, crackers and chips and pretzels and fruit juices and soda. So these are considered less healthy. It's not to say that we can never have them and enjoy them, it's just being conscious of how much we're having, and we're going to talk about a little bit about reducing added sugars. So um, we don't want to think in extremes um, that I can never have this, I can, I can never have that. Anything can be included really in our, in our meal plan, but just being conscious of trying to make healthier choices most of the time. And then we can, of course, allow some flexibility to, you know, so that we can enjoy the things that we like to enjoy. Now here's some tips on choosing high quality carbs. Um, so we want to most times choose um, whole grains uh, such as whole wheat pasta or brown rice uh, for the, the benefits of having more fiber and less of a, a spike in the glucose um, after we eat. 
uh, when we're shopping, we want to focus, for example, if we're having, uh, we're uh, buying bread, choosing those that say 100% uh, whole wheat, 100% whole grain. Um, the least processed, the better. Um, for example, if we're having oatmeal, choosing uh, steel cut versus the instant because it's going to have, the instant is going to have an, um, uh, it's going to spike the glucose quicker, as I mentioned before. Um, and it's also um, less, uh, less healthy because it's more processed. Instead of drinking juice, which is, um, it's going to raise the blood sugar a lot. And it has basically pretty, a pretty empty calories because it loses the, the, the nutrients. Having a fruit instead. Uh, no problems with having fruit. It's just about how much we're actually having um, that will affect um, the, the glucose, the sugar. And then beans and lentils, of course, uh, will have a different effect um, than on the blood sugar than something like potato, rice, um, or, or bread. So not all carbohydrates are created in equal. Now, the fourth um, uh, nutrition principle is limiting added sugars. So uh, as I said before, uh, for example, having a glass of orange juice is not the same as having an orange, right? Because the orange is, has its natural fruits and, uh, and uh, sorry, natural sugar. It also has great amount of um, nutrients and is lower calorie than, than the juice. Um, so it's, and it has the fiber, so it's not gonna spike our glucose as quickly as the juice, which is just sugar. Um, would. So in this example, um, this is an, a breakdown of um, the amount of added sugar that is the, the recommendation um, for, as far as dietary guidelines. So for example, for someone that should have 2000 calories a day, um, their maximum amount of recommended added sugar would be 50 grams, which in this example, we can see how easy it is for us to consume 50 grams of added sugar very um, in our diets very easily, as you see in these two examples. So a can of soda with a candy bar, we can see here has 49 grams uh, versus um, a cup of ice cream, um, which one cup, and this is a bowl, which one has at least maybe almost three cups of, 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 of ice cream there if it's big uh, scoops would be 54. So it's very easy for us to consume a lot of added sugars. So being conscious of that is, is super important. Now, this is these are some ways that um, when you look at your, your food labels, and we'll look at a food label in, in a, the next slide, these are some ways or some, some words that basically means sugar. So when you see these things listed um, in your on your food label, these all uh, equates to sugar. So this is all going to have a nice effect on, on the glucose. Now, the fourth um, um, is reading a food label. It's very important that we all learn how to read a food label because it's very literally the nutrition facts of what we're putting into our body, right? Um, and sometimes some things are advertised as healthy and they may not be healthy. Um, and we have to keep in mind that these companies are are there to sell their product they're not there necessarily to keep us healthy right so we want to make sure that we're doing our part to stay informed so when we're looking at a nutrition label um, we want to first look at the serving size so this is telling us um, that all this information here that's listed calories are carbohydrate vitamin d everything that's listed here is only for uh, that serving size okay two thirds of a cup. So the serving size is very, very important to look at. So as you see here, there's eight servings um, in this container. So that means if I am having two times um, the serving size, I should be multiplying each and every category by two. Okay, so it's very important that we look at the serving size. Um, then secondly, we want to look at specifically for diabetes, we want to look at our total carbohydrate. Um, the higher the total carbohydrate, the more um, that's, uh, the sugar will go up if we have diabetes, right? When we consuming, uh, when we consume the product. So uh, we all need different types, different amounts of carbohydrate throughout the day. It's very individualized. 
And this, if we see a registered dietitian, that person can help us figure out how much carbohydrates we really should be consuming throughout the day. Um, and then the, the uh, third part that's very important is fiber. Uh, the more fiber, uh, the better, right? Helps us keep our bowels moving. And it also helps with um, how quickly the food is absorbed into the bloodstream and how much our glucose goes up if we have diabetes after we consume the, the, the item. And then the added sugars, like I mentioned before, very important to make sure that we're keeping that um, low uh, because of it, its effect on, on our body and on our, on our glucose. So um, these are the four uh, key things that we want to look at when we're looking at uh, nutrition label. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little quick exercise. Um, we're gonna compare uh, these two breakfast. So uh, the first one is a cereal and it has some nuts and it has some strawberries um, and milk. So as we learned um, just a few minutes ago, milk and fruit, and cereal are all carbohydrates. So the first one, uh, the first uh, breakfast, breakfast A, um, A has good amount of carbohydrates. So um, let's compare it to breakfast B. And breakfast B, we have whole wheat bread for um, uh, two slices there, um, which we learned is a carbohydrate. It looks like we have some uh, mashed avocado. We have some nice healthy fats in our avocado. We have tomato, which are our veggies, and we have our egg, which is our protein. So in comparison, uh, the first one we see has more carbohydrate. The only little balance that I see is that it has some nuts, right? Some, some healthy fats, but breakfast B would win in, in my book because it has healthy fats, um, whole grain, um, it has veggies and then it has our protein. So it, it'll probably have less of an effect on the glucose in comparison to breakfast eight. It's not to say that I can never have cereal again, but just be conscious of um, the differences between the two breakfasts. And also if you do have diabetes, check your blood sugar. You can check your blood sugar before you have the meal. And then you can check your blood sugar two hours later and compare and see what happens with the glucose after you eat one breakfast meal versus another one. And it's a great um, learning tool. Now our, our last meal that we're gonna compare is, our, is a lunch. So in the first one, we have a foot long and we have soda and we have chips. The um, second one, or our lunch B, we have half of a sandwich or half of a or six inch. Let's say this is, let's say, I won't say the word, you all know where, where we get foot longs and, and six inches. Um, sandwich shop. And then we have a uh, side salad. So obviously the first choice has more sugar. We have the white bread, we have the soda, and we have chips. In the second one, we have whole grain bread. So that's basically our carbohydrate. And then we have good amount of protein and veggies. So even when we're eating out, we can still try to make the best choice that we have um, to keep ourselves healthy. So I um, encourage you, if you, if you have a diagnosis of diabetes, um, to start comparing your meals, check your blood sugars, as I said before, um, to assess how your body's responding to the foods that you're eating. Um, it's a very good way um, and a very easy and, and, and good learning tool that we can do, okay? So in summary, lifestyle can make uh, a big difference in reducing our risk for developing type 2 diabetes and in helping us manage diabetes. Maintaining or achieving a healthy weight is super important. So remember, it doesn't take losing 50 pounds necessarily. We can start with losing 5 to 7% of our weight if we're overweight or obese, and that makes um, all the difference. Okay, and it's a great starting point. When it comes to um, our food, Variety and moderation are most important. Remember the plate method. It's a very easy way to make sure that we're balancing our meals um, and eating in a healthy way. And lastly, get moving. It makes um, all difference when we're trying to stay healthy, reducing our risk for diabetes and managing um, diabetes. Thank you. Any questions you, you all have, please share and we will do our best to answer them. Thank you so much, Jenny Dehusu. 
Thank you, Sue. Okay. And, Dr. <laughs> and Dr. Jack. Um, do we have any questions? Let me see on the chat. Hmm. I don't Hello. see questions. Hello, I have a question. Can I ask it directly? Yes, of course. Yes. Um, the difference is in the taking your daily glucose, the test on the strip, and the test that they take with your blood. How come sometimes two of those have different readings? Like your daily ones is good. Then when you go there, then it's a higher reading with the with the blood test. How is that? How is that possible? So, so I can take on this question. Thank you for the question. So in general, the glucose meters um, overall are accurate. It depends on uh, the glucose meter that someone has. So they have different uh, levels of accuracy. Uh, it also, with the glucose meter, uh, you're taking that blood sugar on a daily basis, right? Which is right. From, yes. let's say, when you go into the lab and you're getting that blood test done, let's say once every three months or six months or so on. Right. So that's not really capturing the full data. Um, in general, the blood, the sugar, the blood sugar that is done by the blood test tends to be much more accurate, um, just because it has been um, tested across different lab agencies. However, again, it depends on the glucose meter that you're using. So again, different glucose meters have different levels of accuracy. Okay, so is this just maybe you can get a different meter and 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 see if that makes a difference? It, yeah, so see if it makes a difference, but also recognizing that part of the value for the glucose meter is being able to assess patterns and the blood test, you won't necessarily be able to assess patterns because that's just one blood test in a period of time over a three month or six month period of time, as opposed to having daily blood sugar. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another thing to consider is that where, what, the blood is testing or where the glucose is that you're testing. So if we're testing the finger prick as capillary blood versus getting a blood test or poking your vein versus um, using one of those glucose monitors, which is monitoring the glucose in the tissue. So where the glucose, uh, where are we testing the glucose? So they're going to be different. So it's from different, two different parts of the body is what you're saying? Exactly. So the tip is not as accurate as if they take a, in your vein. Is it? Is it? Is this and, not accurate? Well, it's it's the tool, um, like Dr. Jack mentioned, it's the tool. So it's the glucose meter versus the lab uh, method of testing, and so that's one part. The second part is that we're testing glucose in different locations. Okay. So it's not always going to be exact. Oh, okay. If you can compare one to the other. Yeah, I think maybe I just maybe get another group so get another meter and just see if it makes a difference. And that um, they test the two the, meters at the same time, you know, on different days to see if they come up with the same reading. Right. And uh, glucose meters have different accuracy, different brands. Okay. Oh, so there's no one standard for, for the meters, I guess. Unfortunately, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the information. You're welcome. You're welcome. Do we have any more on? Questions, you can unmute. Can you, can I hear you, the sound. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I have a question here. Um, you have a question here. Yeah, I, my question is, is the sugar. Um, is, is the cane sugar uh, better than the white sugar? If you, because I used to use the Splendor. I stopped using Splendor and I used um, the organic raw cane sugar. I only use it once a day for my coffee. I don't use any other sugar other than that. Uh, were you able to hear? Yes, yes. Um, oh, yes. So it, it, it is, I mean, you're, I think you're doing the right thing by you're limiting um, the sugar. Um, so you're putting the sugar in your coffee? Yeah, that's, that's the only thing okay. I I, I have a rule. I don't mess around with people's coffee because <laughs> that's a scary thing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, as long as you're, you're, using it in moderation, it's okay to have a little bit of sugar, just use it in moderation. That's the most important thing. All right, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Uh, one more question here. What's your name? Brenda. Brenda has a question. Yes. I'm, okay, my, hi. I most recently was told that I was borderline diabetic. Yeah, and so that's why I'm interested now. Probably when I got enough stuff wrong with me, I don't want to get that too. 
But, and I don't use sugar at all, at all. I'm just surprised to find some things in the foods that's not naturally there. But I do drink Budweiser beer, <laughs> okay? A lot of beer. <laughs> I love my cold Budweiser. <laughs> and I'm told that that's carbohydrate. And carbs turn into sugar in your body, right? Yes, ma'am. I got to give up Budweiser? <laughs> we we got to cut back. Um, um, so if you have borderline um, diabetes, that's pre-diabetes. Oh boy. Oh, yeah, so borderline diabetes is another way of um I don't use regular sugar at, at all, none. Yeah, but um although you don't use, for example, like table sugar, we all consume carbohydrates in other ways. So um it's a great actually I think it's a great opportunity now for you that you know that you have borderline diabetes or pre-diabetes because now you can take action, right? And we the action we discussed was upping our physical activity safely, eating well, um, and definitely we have to cut back on the Budweiser, sorry. And, um, you know, staying physically active, eating well, and if we're overweight or obese, we lose five to 7% of our weight. And we know, we know that that's gonna help us decrease our risk of developing type two diabetes. Mm. I use coffee creamer in the morning. I don't use sugar, I use the creamer. Is that this is bad or? Okay, so is it is it flavored creamer or just like? Course. Like coffee mate? Nut, yes, hazelnut and French vanilla. Okay, so so that has sugar, right? Because it's, it's flavored. Yes. Yeah, so just make sure you, you limit it. It's not that you're not having too much, but it will have sugar, definitely. Okay. But, you know, go back and look at your label and then you can compare when you go shopping, compare them, compare one brand to the next so that you can make a good choice. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Question. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Can I ask a question? This is Cynthia Niles. Is, sure. is is sweet potatoes um, very, well, it's not the healthiest of foods for us. It has a lot of uh, um, fructose in it that turns to sugar um, without adding sugar. So, I mean, especially during the Thanksgiving holidays, we like to make candy yams and sweet potato pies, and it's not good for kidney health as well. So I just want to ask you, uh, is a you know what what would you recommend in terms of sweet potatoes even versus pumpkin um i don't see any reason why we can't have sweet potato but if we're making it candied so we're, the actual sweet potato on its own it's not unhealthy you know and it's not bad for us to consume it but depending on how we cook it and what we put in it right so we're making it candied um we're, we're taking a product, and I know it's something that we have, and I, I understand, but we're making a product that's in its natural shape, that um, has a good amount of fiber. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it, but we're adding stuff to it and kind of messing it with it. And, and then that, you know, of course, is going to have a bigger effect on the glucose. All right. So how we prepare it, of course, makes a, a, a huge difference, but I challenge you, take your recipe, you know, um, and look online for, uh, you know, other versions that you may find and, and, and experiment until you find something that maybe has less sugar in it and, um, and is something that you can still enjoy. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. I don't know if there was another uh, second part that I may have missed of the question. No, I think you're good. <laughs> okay. Okay, so it's already 12 o'clock. So last question is one more if we could fit we could fit one more. If not, then we're gonna close it. Just one more question I have uh, okay. can contain the sweet potato. So between the sweet potato and the white potato, is that about even with carbs or does it make a difference? It's um, very similar. Um and depending on the potato, because every potato um, is not great, it's not always the same, but um, also fiber content is, is very important because 
um, it will help slow down how quickly the food goes into our is processed and the sugar goes into our bloodstream. But there's nothing wrong with having potato. It's our portion that's most important and balancing that meal. Okay, okay. so a white potato is, is not more dangerous than a sweet potato is what you're saying. Uh, I mean, no, of course not necessarily. Okay. No. Okay. But, you know, um, it's really how we prepare how we prefer it, prepare it, right? And also the portion. There's nothing wrong with having a potato as long as we're watching our portion and we're balancing the meal. And with the holidays coming up, um, I want to mention something that I read once and I've never forgotten. Um, it's a holiday, not a holly week or a holly month. Okay, so it's one day, we make the best of it, we enjoy it, and then we get back on our plan. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Jack, and thank you, Jenny, for the presentation. Sure. I really You're enjoyed welcome. it. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, and God bless.